Welcome to our last and final virtual public witness. Not the last one, though, because we next week we'll be out there on Batavia Street. We hope you can join us. We'll be out there with our signs and being a witness to our migrants and refugees, brothers and sisters. So tonight, um, we have the privilege of um, having um, Genuine Trujillo short story. So um, again, on behalf of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange, we welcome you to our last virtual session of this year's Summer Public Witness. It has been quite an experience hearing migrant stories reflecting on challenging journeys, their learnings, um, how sisters support migrants at the border, and finding ways to advocate for fair immigration, fair immigration reform, laws, and legislation, as well as how to be a supportive and prayerful presence for our brothers and sisters. Brought, on, brought to the U.S. as children and through no fault of their own, young adults came forward to ask for the right to give back to the country they call home. With protection from deportation comes the ability to pursue higher education and forge careers, to move from fear to an, an uncertainty, uncertainty to planning a future with purpose. As you all know, in 2012, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, also known as DACA, awarded temporary work permits and protection from deportation to children to childhood arrivals. The program originally covered about 800 immigrants for young people. DACA allowed them to fill sure. their lifelong Plus, aspirations. I'd like to give a support to them to pursue life, lifelong, uh, life, <laughs> let me start again, uh, allow them to fulfill their lifelong aspirations to pursue careers in education, law, medicine, and other many other fields. DACA changed of their future and on, and on that of their, and that of their lives and families for which they now truly are grateful. But they still live in fear because of DACA may be revoked at any time. Young people are eager to give back to their communities and contribute to their country they call their own. And we know that. And while many young people brought as minors benefited from DACA, many did not. People were brought to the US as children, but who were too old and did not meet the cutoff age and they didn't qualify, and they didn't, couldn't apply. Furthermore, because of a series of anti-immigrant lawsuits, younger generations can no longer apply for DACA and have been left out as well. They are known as dreamers, but they are not documented. Today, we welcome Genuine Trujillo. She's a dreamer born in Mexico. She will share her migrant story and tell us about the many obstacles she's faced in pursuing her law degree. Thank you, Genuine, for joining us today. We are looking forward and eager to hear your story. Now, I pass it on to Mary and they will lead us in tonight's prayer. As we gather together, we pause to recall the presence of our loving, gracious, generous God in our hearts and the workings of the Spirit of the Lord as we are here together collectively. God of love and compassion, you create every person in your divine image and desire us to unite as one, enriching each other with our uniqueness and gifts. Open our eyes to the injustices faced by dreamers 
whose future continues to be under attack. Touch leaders' hearts that they may be moved by the beauty and interdependence of our human family, recognizing that our flourishing as well as our suffering are interconnected. Empower us so we may speak up as one in support of justice and solidarity with our dear neighbors globally. Amen. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, I have the honor of introducing our speaker for tonight, Jinwen Trujillo. Jinwen is a Catholic lay minister, a faith-based community organizer, and an immigration attorney. As a community organizer, she has worked with LA Voice Pico, a faith-based, multi-faith, multi-racial organization working to create a society that reflects the dignity of all persons, working on issues such as immigration, education, and mass incarceration. As a lay leader, she is a religious formation coordinator for Spanish presentations with the Catholic Ministry with Lesbian and Gay Persons of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. And she is also a published author. Her book called LGBT Catholics, A Guide for Inclusive Ministry was published not too long ago by Paulus Press. And I believe she's working on another book. As, she is, as I mentioned, she is an immigration attorney and she is an immigrant herself. So I'm really happy to pass the, the mic over to Jinwen. Uh, Jinwen, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Damaris, for the invitation. And thank you, Maria Elena. I'm very happy to be here with, uh, with all of you. And I hope um, as I share my story, hopefully I can um, help um, expand a little bit of our, our vision when it comes to um, our fight for, for immigrants. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to share my story in a way that I've never shared it before. So it's going to be a little bit more open, a little bit more intersectional. Um, because I've realized that someone who, you know, is an LGBTQ ministry, sometimes I tell my story, you know, from the immigrant side, and then sometimes I, I say it from a different side, but, um, um, I think we can be, become more effective in advocating, um, uh, if we become more intersectional. So, um, as you, as you heard before, I was born and raised in, in Mexico in Leon, Guanajuato, um, Guanajuato is right in the center of Mexico. Um, and so I was uh, born there, raised there. Um, my dad passed away when I was 11 years old. Um, I was born to a family that uh, the person with the, the highest degree of education was my mom with uh, middle school, up, up to middle school. Um, and so uh, when my dad passed away, she had already, she had continued um, her education even after having me and my sister. Um, so she she got to, you know, get a high school degree, but she was never able to, you know, get that that bachelor's degree, which she always wanted. Um, and so uh, when my dad passes away, she loses her job. She realizes her economic opportunities are very, very uh, narrow. And she she realizes that me and my sister are going to end up in a similar situation. And she didn't want that. So she came to the U.S. Um, a couple of years later, my sister joined her. Um, and and then two years later, I joined her. Um, and so by the time I came to the U.S., I was 16 and a half. Um, and uh, and that was around 2003 or so. Um, so I was lucky enough to be able to go to high school. I, I didn't have to work uh, right away. Um, but uh, as soon as I graduated high school, I started um, working full time. Uh, my mom, like many, many migrants, um, she had been working a lot of hours, uh, like 80 hours per week, and uh, she was working for an abusive employer, so she ended up uh, becoming ill. Uh, so my sister and I had to start working. Um, we didn't think that we'd be able to to ever go to, you know, get a bachelor's degree because um, of restrictions that we had, things that we didn't qualify for in terms of um, in-state tuition. Um, and so, uh, so I guess you could say I, I kind of took it easy. So I took my time learning English and going to a community college. Um, and eventually my sister started um, figuring out how to transfer to a four-year university. Um, during that time as well, I, uh, you know, I came out to my mom as an LGBT person. Um, uh, so I, I identify as an LGBTQ Catholic. And 
that was kind of like an extra, you know, tension that is added that uh, I like to mention now because, uh, you know, immigrants, we have intersectional lives. So we have uh, intersectional wounds as well and things that we have to deal with. And so, uh, you know, as an LGBTQ Catholic from a, a migrant family, it's it's hard because there's there's a lot of uh, struggle and there's a lot of there can be some distancing from 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 the family, but at the same time you have to stick together because that's the only way that we can survive as undocumented immigrants. So it was a little bit hard, but um, you know we we kept uh, moving forward. Um, eventually, my sister said, "Okay, there's you know there's maybe a way that we can transfer to a, a four year degree." Um, now I want to tell you a side story that was happening during that time. Uh, so back in, and this is, let me see, I think 2010, um, undocumented immigrants, we didn't have driver's licenses. Um, so we used to meet, um, every Friday, I was part of a, a youth group. Um, after I came out as, as, uh, as gay, my mom sent me to a spiritual retreat that I really loved. So I became part of this youth group and I became part of the leadership. Um, and so every Friday, we, we met every Friday, but then on Fridays in the city of Baldwin Park back then, um, they always had checkpoints. So the city uh, would have four different checkpoints at every you know entrance to the city. Um, and they were making, I think in 2010, they made more than a million, $1.2 million from impounding um, the cars of unlicensed drivers. Now, back then, um, undocumented people, we couldn't get driver's licenses. So it's not that we didn't want to get them, we just couldn't. Um, and so, but uh, what the city of Baldwin Park and many other cities were doing is that they were uh, setting up DUI checkpoints or checkpoints disguised as DUI checkpoints. Um, but they weren't even asking, have you been drinking? What they were doing was just say, you know, license and registration, impounding the cars. Um, uh, they had to impound them for 30 days. So for us to get the cars back, uh, we had to pay about $2,000 to get the car back. Uh, most undocumented people couldn't pay that amount. So then the city would get to keep the car and then they could auction it. So this was, you know, this was theft. <laughs> and so I remember asking people from church, hey, what can we do about this? And um, back then I was a computer science major, so I was not interested in anything social justice oriented. Um, but I remember somebody telling me there's nothing you can do about it. And if somebody tells me there's nothing I can do about something, I'm just going <laughs> to find a way to do it. And so uh, so I had this friend who kept calling me almost every week. They were impounding his car. He he had the money to get get it out and then they would impound it again. And and so he said, you know, and we have to do something. Um, so we. Uh, we said, okay, let's organize a protest um, and let's invite everyone from church. Um, and so we did, we organized a protest. Um, we were hanging flyers at you know laundromats and we sent a press release. We didn't even know what we were doing. We were just having fun with it. Um, and so, uh, so the day of, um, I remember my sister, my mom, uh, myself, my friend, and another friend who recently became, uh, he was ordained as a priest. Um, we all showed up, but nobody else showed up. And so uh, there was this uh, Spanish TV channel, uh, Univision at 6 p.m. And they were like, we are in Baldwin Park and we have this group of people protesting and there were only six of us. Um, <laughs> so it was very, it was very funny, but you know, we were standing with our signs and about an hour later we had um, about 300 people. And so that night we went to the city hall and, um, and we got them to stop the che checkpoints temporarily. Um, at the same time, um, I met, so because of this, I met um, a priest in Baldwin Park, uh, Father uh, Mike Gutierrez, who, um, you know, we, we connected and he was involved in, in faith-based community organizing. And he said, okay, let's, let's continue what you've started. Um, and so we started, uh, I became involved with LA Voice Pico. Um, and we started advocating for, you know, the AB60 driver's license bill so we could, you know, get driver's licenses for all. Um, while this law became, uh, while this became law, we 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 negotiated a, uh, an impound moratorium with the city. Um, and then, you know, we were able to get driver's licenses four years later. So um, from that experience, what I realized is um, there's going to be many, many times when 
you know, friends, allies, um, people in government will tell us there's nothing you can do about that. That's just how it is. That's a rule. Um, but the truth is we can always do more, right? And so, and we can always push the boundaries. Um, and so, uh, you know, around this time, as you know, in 2012, um, uh, President Obama announced uh, the creation of DACA. Um, my sister and I didn't qualify for DACA uh, because again, sometimes when we, when we, when bills or, or, you know, any, any kind of uh, advocacy effort is being, uh, is, is taking shape, sometimes the, the voices of immigrants are not at the table. And so, uh, you know, some people might just decide if you got here after 16, you're too old. If you, if you got here when you were young, but now you're 31 years old, you're too old. Um, and so there's always going to be these restrictions that, um, whenever possible, when we advocate, we have to push those boundaries. Um, because one thing that I, that I ask myself is, you know, who, who is, who are dreamers, right? Um, so the dreamers, um, we have said dreamers are people who qualify for DACA, but the truth is that our parents were dreamers, right? All of us are dreamers. Uh, and, and it's a good thing that we were able to get DACA into place, but now, uh, we have young people who with DACA, and and I see a lot of my peers who have DACA, who now are under incredible stress that they might lose that work permit, they might lose that social security number, or they won't lose the social, but they will lose the ability to use it to work, um, if the courts decide that DACA, you know, is no longer uh, is no longer uh, good for renewals, and so. As I reflect back on me not quali qualifying for DACA, it was more, it was, a, a, you know, it was not a blessing. And at the same time now, it's kind of a blessing because I, I just don't have to stress out as much as people with DACA. But at the same time, I feel, I feel, res I, I feel that I have the responsibility to continue um, advocating for people who have DACA for us to expand um, those boundaries. Because eventually, if DACA is taken away, everyone who now has that DACA will just become part of everyone else, right? And so we have to advocate for something that will help everyone. Um, so to go back to my story, um, my sister figured out how we could transfer to a four-year uh, university. And so she did it first, then I did it. Um, I got my bachelor's degree in political science. Um, we both did this while working full-time. So we were always part-time students. Um, and when I graduated in 2014, um, I decided to take a year off. And after that, I said, okay, now I have this bachelor's degree in political science. And at the time I was offered a job by um, uh, former secretary of labor and now LA County supervisor Hilda Solis. So I had a job offer, but I have no way of getting you know, that job. And so, uh, so I decided, okay, I have to find a way to become independent. Um, and if necessary, right? And and so at the time we were again advocating for another bill at the state level so that undocumented people could get professional licenses. Um, and so I, I knew that I could become an attorney. Um, and so I decided to go to law school. Um, some of my friends and I, we did some fundraising to buy some of my books because as uh, someone who's undocumented, um, you know, you don't have access to to federal student loans. Um, and so trying to figure that out as well. Um, we were selling donuts outside of church. We were selling raffle tickets. Um, and, you know, eventually things, they just came into place in a way that I, I you know, I can only explain as, uh, you know, by God's grace um, that it did happen. I was able to go to law school while working full time. <laughs> and and get the law degree um and so so yeah i became an attorney um that gave me that freedom to say okay if i want to start my own practice i can do that um i don't need a social security uh, number for that um but also it gave me other other options right um and and just to share with you you know my sister's a certified public accountant um but there's still these other restrictions that even when um you know, when we talk about the immigration system as being this uh, system that will, you know, if you do things right, you'll, you know, you, you'll become legalized. Um, that's not true. Our immigration system uh, right now is not based on merit. Um, it's based on there's some level of family unity. 
Um, there's a lot of punishments, even in the family unity context. Um, a lot of you know people that have children who could petition them, but they would have to go back to their country for 10 years, uh, right? So separation of families. There's a lot of um, what I would call moral injury, right? That then becomes uh, financial injury, right? Um, undocumented immigrants pay you know, billions of dollars in taxes, and yet there's a lot of uh, undocumented immigrants who are, you know, in their 70s who can who don't have access to to any kind of, uh, you know, social security benefit. Um, and and again, now we have documented people who who might, you know, who risk losing everything um, if we don't find a way to to advocate for um, for just immigration reform. And so uh, so that's a little bit of my story. I'm, I'm very happy that uh, I'm now able to help others um, get their legal permanent residency. Uh, and, and, and again, still in the uh, still in the fight, still finding ways to to help dreamers, both documented and non-documented. Uh, you might have heard recently of a by uh, President Biden's executive, um, an executive order that is opening other pathways for dreamers, um, regardless of whether they're documented or not. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm very excited about the opportunities. And, and as we move forward, um, just, you know, continue trying to push those boundaries as much as we can. And whenever somebody tells you, you can't do that, uh, just remember that, you know, if we did it in Baldwin Park, we can do it at any level of government. Um, restrictions are just, you know, invisible limitations in our minds and, and we need to push those, those boundaries as much as we can. So thank you. And that's, that's my story. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. And that's amazing. I like that barriers are invisible limitations in our mind. You really spoke the truth on a lot of things to us. Um, we're, we're really grateful to you to learn about your journey and all the wonderful work that you do. Uh, you are an inspiration to me and I know to all people you encounter. And you've brought up so many issues of injustice facing undocumented folks that so many people do not know of and all the money that is taken from them in various ways. Uh, please know that we hold you and all the work that you do in, in our prayers. So now we invite all of you to take a moment to reflect on June Wen's story. And we have two questions. They're up. From what June Wen shared with us, what impacted you most? And what words of support do you offer June Wen? Please think of those and please type your thoughts in the chat. We're going to read some of them aloud. And please uh, take a few moments. What impacted you most? What words of support and encouragement do you offer Jun Wen? So we have some coming in for you, Jun Wen. And this is always a wonderful time because there's so you've inspired us, and now we hope to inspire you by some of our comments. Um, Teresa does remember about the checkpoints, so unjust and a nightmare. They did that too in Orange County. I remember it being done also in Pasadena. And I drove through one with one of my undocumented friends on purpose to see if they would stop us. Um, they didn't, so we didn't have a chance to. <laughs> Thank you, June Wen, for your strength and resilience. You inspire me. It's from Damaris. Maria Elena. June Wen, you are a dreamer helping others accomplish their dreams. You are definitely an inspiration to me and many others. Thank you for your support towards the dear neighbor. You are a role model for many of us. And our friend Alice says, prophetic voices are called to speak truth to power. 
you have been that voice for the voiceless. Marianne says, June Wen, your positive energy is so very inspiring. Thank you so much. And blessings galore in your life. Oh, that's a nice one. Patty says, you have such a positive outlook despite your own continuing setbacks. I think also, as you said, hey, setback, just an opportunity to work through it, right? <laughs> as you told us. Trevor says, thank you, June Wen, for all those you have helped. You are a blessing for so many. If you'd like to write some more, it's not too late. And I would love to see if anyone has any, any questions for June Wen. Please raise your hand physically or digitally and we'll make sure to call on you. So does anyone have any, any questions? Oh, okay, I see Trevor, Trevor. Um, yeah, I have, I have a question. I was wondering um, if you've helped refugee cases and if like how that process compares with other paths uh, to citizenship or, or permanent residency. Sure. Um, and I just want to say, you know, your, your kind words have touched my heart. So if you hear my my voice break a little bit, uh, you know, I might just be tearing up a little bit. Um, so in law school, we actually worked with a couple of um, asylum seekers. Um, and one of them was a uh, Nigerian man. Um, his case, you know, he had a very strong case. Um, he had been the victim of torture under a dictatorship. Um, uh, and he, he, he won his asylum case and he's now a legal permanent resident. So when you have a, a strong asylum case, it's it's a great path. It's a path to residency. It's a path to citizenship. Um, the uh, the other person that I helped was a trans woman from Guatemala. Uh, her case was a little bit more difficult, not because she wasn't actually persecuted. She was suffering persecution, but you know, there's always that um, you know transphobia that gets involved, and um, and so. Um, unfortunately, I did not know what happened with her case um, uh, because that's when I graduated. Um, so again, it's a good path for those who have a strong case, but um, you know, there's there's still a lot of challenges there. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Just raise your hand in the chat or raise your hand physically. Okay. And in the meantime, uh, June, when we have um, more wonderful comments for you, um, your diligence is inspiring. You never give up, no matter what the obstacles. You have definitely answered God's call to use your special talents. It's Chuck. And his wife, Cindy, says, the realization once again of the impenetrable and oft-changing maze of governmental rules, regulations, policies concerning the dear immigrant is profound. Alice says, thank you. I'm sorry. Your inner power and undaunted strength is changing those who hear and are confronted by your presence. Thank you so much. Continue to live in grace. So that's really beautiful. Um, and we'll we'll make sure you have these with you, June Wen, so you can like write them down and you can look at them. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> so I now turn it over to Alice Soto who's a very impactful justice advocate and volunteer with the Justice Center for our action. Thank you. Here are some suggestions to be involved and take action. Advocate until a law that protects DACA recipients is passed into law. 
just immigration reform, which includes eligible migrants, would be the ideal. Speak out. Write an op-ed or a letter to the editor of, our, of your local paper about why you support DACA recipients. Letters can influence editorial writers to take a stand and can strengthen the impression of widespread support. Network Catholic Lobby offers a great resource, including a training video. And you see the uh, link on the bottom here in blue, and it will be in the chat. All of these and many other things that come to your mind, just go for it as we've been told to do tonight. Don't be daunted. We thank you for doing all you can in support of our migrant dear neighbor. Now I pass it on to Damaris for closing remarks. Thank you, Alice, uh, for sharing this important information with us. Honestly, we have no excuse for not being involved. And there's always something we, each of us can do, whether it be a big or small action. So um, I'd like to take some time to thank Jinwen uh, for sharing her her personal journey and um, not just as an immigrant, but also um, someone who's passionate about justice. And um, Janona is a good friend of mine. We've known each other for 10 years and um, I'm just amazed at just the strength she has, and but also the love that she has for the work and um, that you ain't gonna tell me to stop <laughs> kind of attitude. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, and for all of us, all of you here, on behalf of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange, we'd like to thank you all for joining us tonight and listening to Jinwen as she shared her story. Um, as always, you will receive an email with the link for today's recording and the information that we shared. Uh, you know, we just ask, share this with uh, others, share this with your community, with your friends. Uh, all the recordings are online on the Sisters, the the congregation's YouTube channel. So um, speaking of which, this is our final virtual public witness night. So thank you, Jenna, for wrapping it up for us. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our speakers from Teresa, Mamadou, Sister Deidre, and Suzanne for just these amazing stories that they shared and these amazing insights and just the, the love, you, you hear the love that so many people have for their family and for the community of immigrants. So all those stories, um, you can, uh, and we'll include the links on, in the chat, so you can watch those or rewatch those or pass them on, share them with other folks so they can also hear these wonderful stories. Now, beginning next week, August 20th, we will begin our in-person public witness. So for anyone who is local to Orange County or wouldn't mind driving here to the city of Orange, you are all invited to join us on Tuesday nights, uh, beginning you know, from August 20th to September 17th from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. We will gather um, in the parking lot next to the auditorium of the St. Joseph Center. And then we will be along Leveda Avenue, as you can see in these pictures here. And we're going to be a peaceful and unifying presence, showing standing in solidarity with our migrant brothers and sisters, showing our support for asylum seekers for refugees and for immigrants. So hopefully you can join us on one of these nights. Again, spread the good news, spread the word, 